Ready? Chapter 9. Powder and Arms. How good was that? Did it, did it come up? Did it come up, the text? Thank you, Super Vigilante. Wow is correct. Oh, there's plenty more where that came from. You've only had the camera a couple of hours, just you wait. There's plenty more where that came from. Right. Chapter 9. Powder and Arms. The Hispaniola lay some way out. And we went under the figureheads and round the sterns of many other ships and their cables sometimes grated underneath our keel and sometimes swung above us. So this is all to say that they're passing amongst all these ships with anchors and ropes and all that sort of thing. Like, here, here they're going, I'll probably assume, a little, a little dinghy or something out to the, out to the main ship because, of course, you'd have to row out to, to get there. There's no, uh, there's no ramps in these days. Not, a, not to get on a schooner, let alone a galleon. This is a schooner, though. This is a schooner, though. Right. I've lost my place now. Anyway. At last, however, we got alongside and were met and saluted as we stepped aboard by the mate, Mr. Arrow, an old sailor with earrings in his ears and a squint. He sounds great. He and the squire were very thick and friendly. Now that's to say they're thick as in, you know, the old um the old uh old fashioned way of saying that they're really good friends, you know. Thick as thieves, thick as thieves. It's not to say they're idiots. Although as we know, the squire is an idiot. Isn't thick a modern word as well? Don't don't the kids use thick to mean something? But is it something rude? I don't know. Anyway, it's not what Mr. Arrow and the Squire are. They are just good pals. But I... Uh, yes, thick. A T-H-I-C-C, -C, says Green T24680. That's a thing, right? That's a thing. Well, that's not how it's written. Robert Louis Stevenson hasn't written T-H-I-C-C -C for the Squire. The Squire is not thick in that way. They use it to mean mate here in Germany, says Bauble Rob. Hallo, mein Thick. You learn something new every day. It means curvy and not skinny. Thank you very much, Green T, uh, 24680. Thank you for, for clearing that up. I'm out of touch. I'm out of touch. I'm drinking the same thing my granddad drinks out of a silver... Half pint mug that is older than my granddad. He and the squire were very thick and friendly. But I so otherwise it's a lovely description of them, really. It makes them sound both really attractive. But I soon observed that things were not the same between Mr. Trelawney and the captain. Now that's not the that's not the captain, not our um not our flashback. Not ah, uh, the captain is in. But where the one-legged man, Jim? You ho ho and a bottle of rum. Flashback. This is um. This is the actual captain. This is the captain of the Hispaniola. Wow is right, super vigilante. Wow is right. And the, so, Mister Trelawney and the captain. This last, the captain, was a sharp-looking man who seemed angry with everything on board. Oh, this is my favourite kind of person. Furious. And was soon to tell us why, for we had hardly got down to the cabin when a sailor followed us. So just a little a burp then, a little bit, sorry about that. So this is just any sailor, just any sailor, this. And he's, I think he's got about one line, this sailor. Any particular voice he should have? He's basically a... He's a sort of background artist. Um, I'll give him one of those sort of a... Uh, like an old American film. If there was an, an old American film... Well, there is, there is an old American film of um, Treasure Island. This would be sort of... Uh, just, to, just, 
Just an American guy who can kind of vaguely do a piratey voice. Captain Smollett, sir. No, that's, that's rubbish. Captain Smollett, sir, axing to speak with you, said he. So he's written axing after the, you know, sort of sailor fashion. But So, and, you know, this guy's probably from Connecticut, but he's read it verbatim. him. Captain Smollett, sir, axing to speak with you, said he. Wouldn't like that. He's axing to speak with you. And then he's gone. I am always at the captain's orders. Show him in, said the squire. Except there's a bit of bad blood between them, so I'm imagining he's a little bit ironic with that. Oh, I'm always at the captain's orders. Show him in, said the squire. The captain, who was close behind his messenger, thank you very much, captain, entered at once and shut the door behind him. Well, Captain Smollett? Smollett. Well, Captain Smollett? What have you to say? All well, I hope. All ship shape and seaworthy. Well, sir, said the captain. Better speak plain, I believe, even at the risk of offence. I don't like this cruise, I don't like the men, and I don't like my officer. That's short and sweet. He's not messing about, Captain Smollett. A very blunt chap, despite having been described as sharp. I don't like this, I don't like that, I don't like you, I don't like the ship, I don't like anything, I don't like any of these men, I don't like beans, I don't like toast. And that's what I've got to say, and that's short and sweet. Perhaps, sir, you don't like the ship? Inquired the squire, very angry as I could see. I can't speak as to that, sir, not having seen her tried, said the captain. She seems a clever craft. More I can't say. Possibly, sir. He's fuming now, the squire. Possibly, sir. You may not like your employer either, says the squire. And another... But here, Dr. Livesey cut in. There wasn't an and enough there. I added that myself. And if you don't fuck... But, but here, Dr. Livesey cut in. Stay a bit, said he. Stay a bit. No use of such questions as that, but to produce ill feeling. The captain has said too much or he said too little. And I'm bound to say that I require an explanation of his words. You don't, you say, like this cruise. Now, why? I was engaged, sir, on what we call sealed orders. So, again, we can only hope that that's um, some orders that have been uh, just wiped on a seal, um, put in the mouth of a seal, delivered by a seal, perhaps. I'm only joking. We know it means that he, it's, his orders have been sealed, so he can't actually see the finer details of the mission that they're going on. I was engaged in what we call sealed order to sail this ship for that gentleman where he should bid me, said the captain. So far, so good, but now I find that every man before the mast knows more than I do. I don't call that fair. Now, do you? So, basically, everybody's like yammering and he doesn't know a thing. No, said Dr. Livesey. I don't. Next, said the captain, I'll learn we're going after treasure. Hear it from my own hands, mind you. Now, when he says he hears it from his own hands, he doesn't mean, I heard it from my own hands. What? Yeah, I was sat there and one of my hands went, oh, I'll give him for treasure. Um, his hands are how he's describing the sailors. There's, you know, the ship hands, the sailors. They, they, they call them hands in the 18th century. I learned we're going after treasure. Hear it from my own hands, mind you. Now, treasure is ticklish work. I don't like treasure voyages on any account, and I don't like them above all when they're secret. And when, begging your pardon, Mr Trelawney, the secret's been told to the parrot. Silver's parrot? asked the squire. It's a way of speaking, said the captain. Blabbed, I mean. It's my belief neither of you gentlemen know what you're about, but I'll tell you my way of it. Life or death in a close run. That is all clear, and I dare say, true enough, replied Dr. Livesey. We take the risk, but we are not so ignorant as you believe us. Next, you say you don't like the crew. Are they not good seamen? I don't like them, sir, returned Captain Smollett. 
And I think I should have had the choosing of my own hands, if you go to that. Perhaps you should, replied the doctor. My friend should perhaps have taken you along with him. He's saying that to, uh, saying that to uh, the squire. My friend should perhaps have taken you along with him. The squire's like that. But the slight, the slight, if there was one, was unintentional. And you don't like Mr. Arrow? I don't, sir. I believe he's a good seaman, but he's too free with the crew to be a good officer. A mate should keep himself to himself. Shouldn't drink with the men before the mast. Do you mean he drinks? cried the squire. No, sir replied the captain, only that he's too familiar. So basically, Mr. Arrow, this this first mate, rather than being like, You! Shift that over there! Get that round the back! He sat there like that. Ah, oh, and then I says to her, You almost saw yourself out, cos I was, saw you. Ah, yeah, 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 you know the game. Oh, aye, aye. Yes, sir, like that. Giving it a bit of that. Bad gaffer. Well now, and the short and long of it, Captain? Asked the doctor. Tell us what you want. Well, gentlemen, are you determined to go on this cruise? Like iron, answered the squire. Very good, said the captain. Then as you've heard me very patiently, saying things I could not prove, hear me a few words more. They're putting the powder in arms in the four-old. Now, the four-old, so that's basically, that's uh, the powder in arms. So on this ship, they're carrying muskets and they're carrying musket powder. So gunpowder, um, bullets, which of course in those days would have been musket balls. Um, they, you would have something, the powder magazine you would have. So that, you know, that would be where, uh, where you kept all the, all the bullets and the guns and the, and the gunpowder. Because that's how all... Firearms and weaponry worked in the 18th century. Gunpowder. And he's putting it in the four holes. So basically where everyone can get to it. They're putting the powder and arms in the four old. Now you have a good place under the cabin. Why not put them there? First point. Then you bring your four of your own people with you. And they tell me some of them are to be berthed forward. Why not give them the berths here beside the cabin? Second point. So he's saying, like, take all your own, you know, the, this little gang of sort of personal bodyguards and uh, grounds, groundsmen, uh, gamekeepers, caretakers, etc., that for some reason Squire Trelawney has insisted will make good sailors. Keep them next to the cabin when the guns and all that are under the cabin, basically, so nobody dodgy can get their hands on the weaponry. Right? Any more? Asked Mr. Trelawney. Fuming, fuming. One more, said the captain. There's been too much blabbing already. Far too much, agreed the doctor. They're all looking at Trelawney like that. Yes, there's been quite a lot of blabbing. I don't know. Blabbing? You're, you, you blabbed. I'll tell you what I've heard myself, continued Captain Smollett. That you have a map of an island, that there's crosses on the map to show where the treasure is, and that the island lies, and then he named the latitude and longitude, exactly. I never told that, cried the squire, to a soul. The hands know it, sir, returned the captain. Lifts it up, but that must have been you or Hawkins, cried the squire. No backbone, no backbone. They'll blame anyone. They'll blame it. They'll never take responsibility. They will never take responsibility for anything. The upper classes. They'll never. They'll never take responsibility. The the the, the minute they accept any blame, they take responsibility. They never will. They never will. Um. Anyway. But it wasn't me. I'm blaming my best friend or a child. So with these little notifications going on. Mute. 
It must have been you or Hawkins, cried the squire. It doesn't much matter who it was, replied the doctor, and I could see that neither he nor the captain paid much regard to Mr Trelawney's protestations. Neither did I, to be sure. He was so loose a talker. He has, but he's been walking all the way up and down that dock. I've got a treasure map! Shh! The f Trelawney! Oh, sorry! Excuse me. Yeah? I've got a treasure map. He'll, be, he'll have been doing that for days while he's been in Bristol. Yet in this case, I believe he really was right. And that nobody had told the situation of the island. Well then, how do they know? Well, gentlemen... Continued the captain. I don't know who has this map, but I'll make it a point it should be kept secret even from me and Mr. Arra. Otherwise, I should ask you to let me resign. I see, said the doctor. You wish us to keep this matter dark and to make a garrison of the stern part of the ship manned with my friend's own people and provided with all the arms and powder on board. In other words, you fear a mutiny. Sir, said Captain Smollett, with no intention to take offence, I deny your right to put words into my mouth. No captain, sir, will be justified in going to sea at all, if you had ground enough to say that. As for Mr. Arra, I believe him thoroughly honest. Some of the men are the same, or maybe, or maybe, for what I know. But I'm responsible for the ship's safety and the life of every man jack aboard of her. I see things going, as I think, not quite right. And I ask you to take certain precautions, or let me resign my berth, and that's all. Captain Smollett, began the doctor with a smile. Did ever you hear the fable of the mountain and the mouse? You'll excuse me, I dare say, but you remind me of that fable. When you came in here, I'll stick my wig. You meant more than this. He's always bringing his wig into it, Dr. Livesey. He loves that wig. Who can blame him? We've heard very complimentary things about him. Doctor, said the captain, you're smart. When I came in here, I meant to get discharged. I had no thought that Mr. Trelawney would hear a word. No more I would, cried the squire. Had Livesey not been here, I should have seen you to the deuce. The deuce, sir. As it is, I've heard you, I will do as you desire. But I think the worse of you. Oh, God forbid, the squire disapproves. There's a man whose respect I'm keen to gain. That's as you please, sir said the captain. You'll find I do me duty. And with that, he took his leave. Now, big pardon for knocking the mic down. Now, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I think Captain Smollett is a badass. He's like that to, will you, will you shut up and listen, I'm in charge. Captain Smollett's like that. I don't bloody care. I'll do what I bloody well like. You'll find I do me duty. Imagine if you could always like mic drop like that. You'll find I do my duty. You're a fucking prick. That's as may be. You'll find I do my duty. Everyone's like that. What does he mean? What does he mean? What duty? What duty? Smollett has seen it all, says Bulba Robbie. Yeah, yeah, he has. He's been around the block, this boy. He's been on all kinds of cruises, as he calls them, cruises. He's really in charge, says Grinty 2468. Yeah, he is, he is. Squires like that. Oh, I'm finishing my ship, I pay for it. You'll find I do me duty. Oh, yeah. You'll find I do me duty. Might drop. Trelawney, said the doctor, contrary to all my notions, 
I believe you've managed to get two honest men on board with you. That man and John Silver. Silver, if you like, cried the squire. But as for that intolerable humbug... Mind your language, mind your language! Intolerable humbug, you're an intolerable humbug. Bet he has a long coat for extra dramatic effects, as many slot knives as him. Yeah, definitely. You'll find a doomy duty. <laughs> Actually, he'd have a lovely sort of, um, probably a sort of uh, dovetailed skirt around his uh, jacket with two buttons at the base of the spine, you would imagine, as a captain of a, captain of a ship in 1769. It had been very dapper, very dapper chap. Uh, Silver, if you like, cried the squire. But as for that intolerable humbug, I declare I think his conduct unmanly, unsailorly, and downright un-English. Heaven forbid. Well, says the doctor, we shall see. When we came on deck, the men had already begun to take out the arms and powder, yo-hoing at their work. Yo-hoing, says, uh, says Robert Louis Stevenson. Yo-ho, yo-ho. No particular tune mentioned. Um, I imagine it probably would go something like, uh, so what they're doing, they're moving guns. <laughs> moving guns from one bit of the ship to the other. Yo ho it. Yo ho, yo ho. Pass the musket to your mate. Yo ho, yo ho. Don't steal any pistols. Yo ho, yo ho. If you can, steal a few bullets. Yo ho, yo ho. Only joking, Captain. Captain Smollett walking past. Off like that. Yo hoing at their work while the captain and Mr. Arrow stood by superintending. Well, no, Mr. Arrow, he's probably joined it in. Yo ho, yo. he looks at the captain. Yo ho, captain's like that. Yo. The new arrangement was quite to my liking. The whole schooner had been overhauled. Six berths had been made astern out of what had been the after, out of what had been the after part of the main hold. This is a lot of um, this is a lot of uh, ship specifics. Uh, so I apologise for that. If you've got the main, if if, if you've got the, you've got the main hold, uh, the after part of the main hold. Um, and this set of cabins was only joined to the galley and forecastle by a sparred passage on the port side. Now. I've tried to kind of bring us all along here with the um, the 18th century nautical terminology, but even I'm a bit lost here. If that makes any sense to you, Godspeed. Six birds have been made astern. So basically, uh, the back of the ship, we've got the um, we've got a few bedrooms going on. Uh, do you want the galley and the forecastle by a sparred passage? The galleys are like um, sort of the main gangway. Is that right? Along the ship, and the foxels, the sort of um, the foxels, the it's like the big um, what do you mean? Four castle. It's spelled four castle. It's like the 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 bit that sticks out the end, you know, the bit that sticks out the end of an old ship, the foxel. Um, Spar passage on the port side. No chance. No chance. It had been originally meant that the captain, Mister Arrow, Hunter, Joyce, the Doctor, and the Squire were to occupy these six berths. Now, Red Ruth and I were to get two of them. So, Mr. Carson, Mr. Red Ruth, he is coming along. So, he's bought basically the Hagrid of his um, of his estate to just be a sailor. I bet he's chuffed. I was looking after silverware and guinea fowl about three days ago. Now, I've got to learn how to climb 30 foot of rope. On a moving boat, and I'm not fed up with this. But I'll do. But he's very loyal. He's very loyal to the family of the family Trelawney. I'll do. I'll do whatever the family says. They're the only family I've got. That's a little quote for those in the know. They're the only family I've got, Jim Hawkins. Now Red Ruth and I were to get two of them. 
that Mr. Arrow and the captain were to sleep on deck in the companion, which had been enlarged on each side till you might almost have called it a roundhouse. Very low, it's, very low it was still, of course, but there was room to swing two hammocks. Now that's not a... That's not like room to swing a cat. That's literally there's room to swing two hammocks because that's what they'd be sleeping in, hammocks. Imagine that, rolling a big, huge wooden ship on the stormy Spanish main in a hammock. How would you sleep? How would you sleep? And even the mate seemed pleased with the arrangement. Even he, perhaps, had been doubtful as to the crew. This is Mr. Arrow we're talking about here. But that is only guess. For, as you shall hear, we had not long the benefit of his opinion. I'll leave that there. We were all hard at work, changing the powder and the berths, when the last man or two, and Long John, along with them, came off in a shore boat. The cook came up the side like a monkey for cleverness. So he's like that. Like Yoda when he gets his lightsaber out. On deck. Lands like that. Like Dragon Ball. His crutch. And as soon as he saw what was doing, So ho, mates! Says he. What's this? We're a changing of the powder, Jack. Answers one. Who knows who that one was? Well, maybe it's that same like American extra from earlier. We're a changing of the powder, Jack. Answers one. Why, ba? Why, by the powers, cried Long John. If we do, we'll miss the morning tide. My orders, said the captain shortly. Oh, that, 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 lot, him and Long John, they'd be like that. Who say, all right, lads, who's had us move the powder? In the background. My orders. He comes into focus, he's like that. Long John's like that. Oh, your orders. Aye, aye, captain. Like that, do you know what I mean? My orders. He's having none of it, Captain Smollett. My orders, said the captain surely. You may go below, my man. Oh, condescending, condescending. Ansel wants supper. So he's like, all right, we don't need your contribution. Get down. Get down the old. Get them... Get them chicken Kievs in youth. These boys are hungry. Very hungry. So mind your business. <laughs> oh, silly. Get them chicken Kievs in. He's just my uncle now. I've just made him my uncle David. Get them chicken Kievs in youth. Mm. He's a he's a he's a cook, my uncle. He's a, he's a, that's his job. He's a cook. He ran a pub. Get them, go on. Aye, aye, sir. Answered the cook, and touching his forelocks as his sort of, sort of kind of respect. Aye, aye, sir. So they're sussing each other out. These pair they're sussing each other out. Get below, youth. Aye, aye, sir. And touching his forelock, he disappeared at once in the direction of the galley. He always leaps to, obeys his orders, Long John. That's a good man, Captain, said the doctor. Very likely, sir, replied Captain Smollett. He's now pulling the wool over his eyes. Easy with that, man. Easy. He ran on to the fellows who were shifting the powder. And then suddenly observing me, examining the swivel we carried amidships, a long brass nine. Uh, so that's a cannon, big cannon. Here you, ship's boy, he cried. Out of that. Off with you to the cook and get some work. Go and get them potatoes peeled. And then as I was hurrying off, I heard him say quite loudly to the doctor, I'll have no favourites on my ship. I assure you, I was quite of the squire's way of thinking and hated the captain deeply. End of chapter.